So I was tasked today to um, switch gears and talk a little bit about, um, about differential diagnosis, which is something that we've been thinking about for uh, many years in pediatric MS. And Emmanuel um, uh, alluded to some of the issues that we faced. And at the end of this talk, I hope that you will be as confused as we have been for the past 15 or 20 years. But I hope I'll be able to shed a little bit of light on um, some of the diagnostic categories as they've changed through time. Now, I want to start off. I got a, um, uh, I got a list of um, the kinds of backgrounds that you have, but I just want to make sure that I understand everyone that's out here. How many of you are clinicians? Excellent, good. Okay, so this is, a, this is geared towards clinicians. How many are researchers? Okay. How many are in pediatrics? Oh, there are actually some people in pediatrics. Delightful. Okay, so I may be able to quiz you too. Maybe I should just quiz the adult uh, practitioners. So I'll start off um, just by uh, showing you my disclosures. We were asked to give a disclosure uh, slide. And then to sort of uh, talk a little bit about um, my objectives. I've highlighted them. But what I want to do is really let you know that I'm not going to be talking about leukodystrophies. OK, that's a, that's a big topic in itself. I was asked to talk about mimics. But as Emmanuel um, noted, um, just a few minutes ago, there have been shifting categories through time. So what I'd like to concentrate on is how our thinking has changed and how that may affect your practice now. Okay? And I have some pictures for you. And I'm going to ask for, I, we're, we have limited time, so I won't ask you too many probing questions, but I'm going to ask you a few questions about these patients. And I'm going to give you some ages. So I'll start off with patient A. Um, this is an 18-month-old that comes in not walking. Can someone just comment on the MRI scan? Not walking. Over here, Tanuja's commenting. Yes, OK, excellent. Excellent neurological interpretation. Thank you, Tanuja. OK, and I'm going to ask the overall question to the audience. Um, is this, first of all, is this MS? Yes, no. Yes? No. OK, very good. Is this going to happen again? Yes? No. Great confidence within the audi audience. Excellent. OK, B. Anyone want to comment on this? Not Tanusha. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on this quickly? This is a slam dunk. I hear someone over here, but I don't see you. Quick comment, or I will. Ah, a nodding head right here. Yes. Yes. Looking to the B case, uh, periventricular lesions look more for demolition. Spinal cord lesions look to me as well very segmental. So I'm adult neurologist and possibly would think that it's MS. Yes, OK. Well, you already gave an answer, even though. So, so everyone in the audience is going to have to agree with you, probably. Most of you are adult MS practitioners. Um, and so absolutely, recur or not recur, I think the vote in the audience is this is something that's going to go on. OK, what about number three? Comments on number three? See? Uh, maybe I'll pick on this side of the room. Lauren is smiling. <laughs> That's what you get for smiling. Yeah. So, you know, the longitudinally extensive disease, uh, the location in, in the brainstem, I would think um, uh, that this is likely to be recurrent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So a 16-year-old also. I, I wanted to mention the age. So that was a four, B is a 14-year-old, C is a 16-year-old, longitudinally extensive lesion, likely recurrent. And then <laughs> D, 11-year-old. Um, Seizure, can't see. Comment from this side of the room. This is an eye. 
<laughs> Comment on the eye. Yes. Ah, okay. Any other comment? What does the eye look like? Papilledema. Yeah, papilledema, right? Papillitis, papilledema. And then what about the brain? Comment about the brain? The, the solitary lesion. There's a lesion, juxtacortical white matter. Yes, and, and uh, a few tiny ditzels, right? So close to the gray matter, comes in with a seizure, probably affecting the cortex to some point, to some extent. Okay, and this one, recurrent or not recurrent? There's, oh, Tunisia voting yes. And it, yes? No. The audience is split. Okay, so our job today is to, as you walk into the clinic room, to help you to talk to families about what the future holds and to think about the categories that have uh, changed through time and the testing that's available now and the utility of that testing. Okay, so um, when all of us, and, and it's, it's, it's nice to see um, Lauren and Tanuja and Emmanuel here in the room because when all of us started out, when we, we, what we started out with was trying to understand the categories and understanding what we were seeing clinically, but not really get, having a handle, especially on the monophasic kids and the kids that um, were out of the ordinary for MS. Because we started from a point of saying, what makes MS MS? And what makes other things other things? And so the categories as they as they came out in the about 15 years ago were that there were monophasic disorders and then there were recurrent disorders. And they constituted things like neuromyelitis optica, which everyone in the audience is familiar with, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and MS. And then if you had further episodes, you might have something called multiphasic acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or recurrent acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Now, these are historically uh, used, but our categories have changed so much now, and this is really what um, we want to talk about. And, and really, the question is, can you make a diagnosis? Are you gonna, how many of these are you going to call MS? You definitively called one MS. The gentleman in the blue shirt pointed out that patient B had MS. How many others of these will you call MS? And to Emmanuel's point about the collaboration with the German group and the, the uh, lack of um, concordance with some of the expected findings with viral serologies, are we, can you call the things that we used to call MS, MS today? Those are the questions. What happened to these MRI scans? So I'm just gonna show you. Comment, Tanuja? Okay, cleaned up, right? Totally cleaned up. B, stayed the same. C, Lauren? Resolution, Resolution. looking good. D? Oh, whoops. D, comment on the eye? Yeah, marked atrophy. Okay, so what will happen next? I'm going to take you through some diagnostic categories. Emmanuel uh, mentioned the epidemiology, and, and there have been a number of studies in um, North America and in Europe that have suggested very similar numbers, about one per 100,000 per year. Um, this is from the UK, from the US, from Germany, from Canada, um, and um, studies in the US. But notably, 70 to 80% of the kids that we take care of, the under 18s, do not have MS. And importantly, as Emmanuel pointed out before, but I just want to highlight that when you have a, when you have a first event of neuroinflammation or demyelination, the distribution is actually such that there is a peak, 
Someone mentioned, a, asked a question about bimodal peaks. There's a peak around the teen years, but there is a large group of children with a first neuroinflammatory event that occurs at under age 10 years. And in fact, Tanuja mentioned acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, that um, the kids that have the monophasic disorders and are labeled as having acute disseminated encephalomyelitis are actually for the most part in the younger age group, and recurrence is more likely to occur in the older kids. Okay, I'm trying to advance. Okay, so remember this. If you see children, and how many of you actually see children? Okay, so even if you are adult practitioners, you see children. And so if you have a child that rolls into your clinic, uh, or into the emergency room and is under 10 years of age, one of the things that we as child neurologists can sort of take a deep breath and be happy about is that if they look terrible but are under 10, the likelihood that they're going to have a monophasic condition is actually quite high. Emmanuel pointed out that 20% of the MS cohort that, um, that she described was under the age of, um, of 10 or 12. Did you say 10, 12? And under the age of 10, um, I'm going to point out a couple of things about the younger kids. Okay, now I'm just going to talk briefly about definitions. Um, and again, these are definitions. Actually, Lauren was first author on this, and, um, and I think uh, many of the people in the room were part of this from 2013. But I just want to remind you that um, when these definitions were um, first coming out. Encephalopathy was thought to be a, um, a key feature that distinguished kids that have had the monophasic variant of an inflammatory central nervous system condition versus MS. And that, and to remind you that acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, as much as we like to use that term as a syndromal diagnosis, and we've learned a lot about that since, but these are really just to put up some definitions for you. Whereas um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is a monophasic condition that um, was not associated with um, recurrence and was associated with encephalopathy, CIS is not MS and not encephalopathy, and constituted things like optic neuritis and a brainstem lesion and that type of thing. And then pediatric MS was defined as pediatric MS, and this is where it got challenging, and it gets challenging, um, and where we've learned a lot in the recent years, is, is that if you are older than 12 years of age, the McDonald criteria work very well, and you can use the McDonald criteria. If you are younger, you're more likely to have acute disseminated encephalomyelitis-like appearances, and you need to wait until there are non-encephalopathic presentations. Now, this, again, is historical. I'm presenting it to you because these are the definitions, and they are the ones that were published in 2013, but a lot has changed since then, and a lot has changed in terms of defining our categories. I want to just remind you that the McDonald criteria do work in children and that they work in children, especially if they're older than 12 years of age, okay? Um, and that the 2017 criteria are actually very good in children. And the most important thing, how many of you do spinal taps to make a diagnosis these days now? Okay, a growing number in the audience. In the pediatric population, um, we do spinal taps on everyone. And I'm not going to talk about the wide differential diagnosis of the kids that roll into our doors, but we do do spinal taps on everyone um, because often in pediatric MS, the lesions are larger, they're confluent, and there is a large differential diagnosis associated with it. Okay, so how are we going to stratify? This is an older paper, but it, um, but it brings out something that is very, what I feel is very clinically useful, and that's the fact that if you are a child and you present with T2 lesions not on the MRI, that's kind of a double negative, if you don't have T2 lesions on the MRI, then your risk of MS is actually very low, okay? If you have brain lesions, your risk is higher. And if you are 
less than 12 and have a disseminated inflammatory encephalopathic presentation, your risk is also very low. These are all good things. And that's how you can, when you walk into the room, say to families, I think your risk is very low. But look at this. Once your encephalopathy goes away, and I'm not going to say MS right now because, uh, again, this was published before a lot of things that we know, but your risk of having recurrent disease is going to be in the neighborhood of 30%. If you're older than 12, you have lesions in the brain, your risk for MS, of a diagnosis of MS, is about 60%. It's very high. Okay? So this is something useful that you can take back to the clinic and say, what can I, how can I predict whether or not I need to start DMTs, whether or not I can um, tell families to go home and be happy and celebrate. Okay? OK, so coming back to this, is there a place for phenotypes and markers? And already, Tanuja mentioned acute disseminated encephalomyelitis for our first child right here. And Lauren mentioned recurrent disease in, in this child right here. Remember, this is an 18-month-old child, and this is a 16-year-old uh, child. Would everyone agree with those diagnostic categories? Anyone disagree? OK, so what are you going to say to these families? This family? Be happy? Celebrate? Yeah, OK. I'll tell you the story of this kid later. OK, and what about this one? Be happy, celebrate? Not really. Okay. You can't really be happy and celebrate in this course. But remember that the MRI cleaned up. And re remember also that um, therapies, which Nuj is going to touch on for other reasons, um, are very effective these days. So I actually, say, when I see this, I say, okay, well, it's kind of sad, but be happy and celebrate because it's treatable. Okay. Um, okay, so the phenotype of ONTM. Everybody in this room knows the phenotype of ONTM. What is the first thing you think about with ONTM? NMOSD, right? Okay, so how, how, do, how does NMO in children differ from in the adult population? Um, really, all I want to um, let you know here is that um, it occurs in children as well. It's probably proportionally more frequent um, in children than in the adult population. We see a lot of ONTM combinations, but, they, but the aquaporin-4 positivity uh, is not 100%. It's probably in the area of 60 to 70%, and this, this has been published. The other thing that you want to remember is that MRI brain lesions are present in many children with aquaporin-4 disease, and it is actually a very important differential diagnosis in the pediatric population. I know that you guys are all used to thinking about this in the adult population, but remember, there can be very large lesions, and, um, and, the, um, and the fact that longitudinally extensive lesions may exist in MS in the pediatric population. I didn't share that with you, but they may exist in the pediatric MS population means that it's not as straightforward as that one MRI scan I showed you. So always, always, always think about both MS and, and aquaporin-4 disease when you see a child with brain lesions and a longitudinally extensive lesion. OK? So um, aquaporin-4, NMOSD, is an important consideration. We can get a child with neuroinflammatory disease with a longitudinally extensive uh, lesion. But also, and this is something that many of you in the room are very familiar with and comfortable with, there is the issue of the child with severe optic neuropathy and a brain lesion, which we showed you. Now, how many of you would think that this might be aquaporin-4 positive? None. Oh, Tanuja is saying, maybe, yeah. It's a maybe. For sure it's a maybe. What else could it be? Mog. 
Of course, okay? So the sever severity of the ON can be linked, can be associated with aquaporin-4 disease, or it can be associated with MOG disease. And I'm gonna show you some numbers in the pediatric population, which actually have surprised me. Tanusha's known this for 100 years because she's been thinking about MOG since the beginning of time. But not everybody believed that it was an important biomarker for quite some time until recently. And I wanna show you numbers, these, a, a great, deal of work has been published, and a lot of landmark work has been published from the Oxford group here. But I'm going to show you, just give you a taste of uh, some of the things in our population um, to get you thinking about it, because it's not just MOG, it's the question of recurrence. Back to the beginning, how can we predict? How many of you say that MOG predicts recurrence? How many say no? How many say, I don't know? That's the majority of the room. Yes, you are with the literature. OK. So um, remember that MOG antibodies really for, first described quite a long time ago, have been used experimentally for some time. People have wondered about their relevance in neuroinflammatory disorders for quite some time. It can be monophasic or relapsing. And that's why I was really pleased to see everyone a lot of people in the room saying don't know because it does not necessarily signify recurrence. And that's kind of a fallacy we've gotten into with getting positive tests that many people say, I've got a positive test, it must mean something right now. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some information from our group that, um, that has made me think twice and, and this has been, you know, many other people are looking at this as well, made me think twice about how to interpret these um, tests. Remember that it has been published that per persistent MOG antibody positivity is linked with a higher risk of relapse, and these are the numbers I'm gonna show you. So we looked at MOG antibodies. How many of you are testing for MOG antibodies these days? And are you getting a lot of positives? Yes or no, yes? No? A lot of people getting a lot of negatives. Um, what about the pediatric people in the room? Positives? A lot, yes, absolutely. And so we looked at um, about 250 of our kids prospectively um, and, um, and divided them into different um, groups depending on their presentation. The traditional um, acquired demyelinating syndrome, others, which were considered neuroinflammatory, but not necessarily uh, consistent with a, what we would, would have called a demyelinating phenotype, seizures, encephalopathy, um, and then MS patients. And um, it was striking um, to us that none of the, well, and, and this has been shown in, in many other cohorts, none of the kids that had that classical picture of MS, like the one that you pointed out, B, were MOG positive, suggesting a very different biology in the kids who were testing positive than the kids with that classical presentation. Going back to this issue of what is it that the younger children have? Whereas those with the acquired demyelinating syndromes, as described before, almost half of them were positive. These were done at onset, and, and, then, and when we looked at the patients with relapsing disease, what we found was that those were antibody positive were more likely than not to uh, Sorry, that, that those, were antibody, those that were antibody positive were more likely than not to be relapsing. But importantly, that the timing was really important. And this has been shown by many people, but I want to remind you, and I didn't put the numbers up here, but about 50 to 70% of children that present with an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis phenotype will start out with a positive MOG antibody. 
And probably even a higher percentage of those that come in with an, uh, a severe optic neuritis or an o isolated optic neuritis who are aquaporin-4 negative. But not all of them will have persistent antibody positivity. And in fact, um, and Julia Longoni, who is a new faculty in, at the University of Toronto, um, took our data and looked at it and, and showed that if you kept testing children, the, you could, kids, who were 12 plus months out and MOG positive separated themselves out. And in fact, the positive to negative conversion was associated with decreased relative risk of re relapse. So those that were persistently MOG positive were more likely to have relapsing disease than those that were negative. And the cut point really was anywhere between six to 12 months. We didn't have continuous uh, blood draws, of course, in these children, but it looks like you may even have to wait 12 months before retesting. So these are our children. You guys made the diagnoses. Aquaporin-4 disease, MS, persistent MOG positivity, and transient MOG positivity. Those are the things that we most commonly see. And I hope this has given a little bit of information, given you a little bit of information to take home so that you can talk to families, think about the uh, relevance of the different kinds of testing that have become available to us, and help you to have conversations with families. What has happened to us? We've gotten a lot more detailed, we have recognized the heterogeneity within our population, which all, everyone in the audience has recognized through time. And in fact, brought more diagnoses within the category of neuroinflammatory disorders, which we thought were never related to what we do. So really, um, I want to leave you with the positive message that most of what we see in pediatrics is self-limited, and that not all recurrent disease is MS. I didn't touch on the other sort of uh, systemic and genetic mediated problems that we see that are inflammatory, but they actually constitute half of what I see. It's important to note, and Tanusha will be speaking to this more, or may not be if she's speaking specifically on MS, but, but that um, these things are actually Understanding the heterogeneity and diving down deeply into the heterogeneity of these disorders is, is really very important because targeted therapies in, the, in this era of personalized medicine, targeted therapies can be offered, they can be developed, and it helps us to have the conversations with the families about what outcomes might be. That's really all I have from here. These are my acknowledgments. I really thank the organizers for including pediatric MS. I don't know what criticism was written about last, uh, <laughs> last time that, that Bill mentioned, but um, this, it's a privilege to be here, and, uh, and thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions.